Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us this morning here uh, on our Mesh Energy webinar. Um, hopefully you are all sitting comfortably. Um, this morning, uh, we've got Graham Hendra with us, who is our, um, our local heat pump expert. Um, Graham's been working in the industry for more of the years than he can, cares to remember. Um, and is a is really the the man that we go to when uh, when we get stuck. Um, the subject for this morning's talk is um, about what we can expect over the next year or so um, in the heat pump industry. Um, there are quite a lot of changes going on uh, with things like building regulations and uh, the end of the RHI and all those kind of things. And there's going to be some some impacts that that will have on the industry, um, mostly for the positive. Today. Um, is I'll hand over to Graham uh, once we've gone through the introductions. Um, but and then we're going to get the crystal ball out and um, we're going to uh, look at some of our predictions um, for the coming year. Um, so specifically on heat pumps, um, but obviously a lot of these sort of surrounding peripheral things will affect the heat pump markets. So there'll be uh, we'll talk a little bit about the updates, the energy efficiency standards and guidance, um, some of the green incentive schemes. Um, and also where client appetite is going. Um, so we'll see, uh, we'll just have a look at, um, at, you know, how the market is likely to change from in terms of demand. And then we'll talk about air source versus ground source and, and how we see the split in the market uh, changing over time. And we'll talk a little bit about um, giving people what they actually want uh, from a heat pump. Then we'll come on to some of the more te technical aspects about uh, the heat pumps themselves. Um, so we'll look at both new build and retrofit installations and how they they will probably diverge a little bit um, going forward. We'll talk about flow temperatures, um, system integration, and finally a little bit about um, the control systems. Um, and Graham will give us his thoughts on those. And then finally, the aim is to try and leave quite a bit of time at the end of the presentation uh, to answer questions. So talking about regulation and markets. Graham, I'll hand over to you now. There we go. So there, there are some fairly major changes to the building regs coming um, in June of this year, um, which are obviously all going in, a, in the same direction. Essentially, um, the thing we've got to aim for is reducing carbon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, if you can click for me again, I'm not going to cover the regs in great detail today because I'm more of a heat pump man than a regulation man um, but obviously the regulations constantly need upgrading and um, making more stringent and basically pushing us in the direction that we all want to go which is towards um, reduction in carbon so next slide please um, so when we look at uh, the retrofit guidance and best practice, um, there's all sorts of uh, bits and pieces that we, we have to look at. But the one that interests me most is um, MCS, who are essentially the gatekeepers to the grants for heat pumps. So in April, there is a major change to MCS. Um, at the moment, an installer is, is both a designer and an installer. Um, and in April, to try and basically expand this scheme, they're breaking it into two. So installers can, if you will, pass a simpler set of regulations to just be qualified to install, and other people can take on the mantle of being a designer. So essentially, if you were um, looking at a project as an installer, at the moment, you'd have to carry out lots and lots of calculations, fill in lots of paperwork and so on. Um, and what you could, will be able to do in April is pass that to your supplier or a nominated designer, somebody like me. So I would fill in the 70 pages of paperwork with your design and then hand it to you. And I would take responsibility for the design and you would have your, this is the heat pump and radiators and underfloor heating that's going to work best in your um, in your application. Um, the reasoning behind this is essentially that heating engineers as a rule don't really want to fill in lots of paperwork. They're very good at installation, but they're not very good accountants. So um, it's basically breaking the, the work down into the people who are best at doing it. So if you can click again, please. So, um, there is obviously action from everybody to, to increase regulation and, and make the regulations better and more fit for purpose. 
Um, but MCS, it looks like, are going to continue to be the people who really push the industry in the direction that um, we want it to go. Um, and they do that because you, you have to do, you have to work with the MCS because, as I mentioned, think of them as the kind of police or the gatekeeper to the grant. If you don't act in an MCS approved way, you don't get any money. Um, so everybody behaves themselves properly. Okay. Um, so one of the things that we've seen over the last sort of 15 years, I guess, is that uh, the people who are interested in the technology tend to be people who are educated in the kind of green agenda. Um, and so those people, early adopters, if you will, we are seeing more and more and more of these people as the media gets hold of, um, of uh, carbon neutral as a message. Um, so what we're seeing now is more and more people coming through. If you look at the rise of electric cars and so on, people are becoming more and more aware of these issues and beginning to come to talk to us about going down the, the uh, path of reduction of carbon, even though sometimes it costs them more money than sticking with what they have. Um, so we're beginning to see this, especially um, people with kids. Um, the kids are learning a lot about this at school and they're beginning to push their parents. Um, so uh, yeah, it's really very positive. It's a, it's a nice change from 10 years ago when everyone talked about money. People are actually beginning to talk about carbon now. Um, obviously in commercial clients, um, one of the uh, things here is that we're seeing many, many companies um, joining systems like B Corp and so on, where they need to show their customers and their suppliers that they are acting in a uh, carbon sensible way, if you will. Um, so we're beginning to see people come to see us saying, can you help us on our journey? Um, you guys are the experts. What do, what do we need to do, really? Which is, which is lovely. It's nice that we don't have to push like the clappers anymore. People are beginning to come to us. Um, so that's all very positive. Can you click again for me, please? Um, so our prediction, oh, sorry, there, there we go, it doesn't matter. Um, but if we look at the green incentive scheme, oh, so our prediction there you can see is that the number of clients will increase um, and, and we're beginning to see that sort of really uh, gain traction. So if we look at the green schemes, um, up for the last eight years has been a thing called the Domestic RHI, Renewable Heat Initiative. Um, and this is going to be replaced by a thing which is actually called the BUS or the Boiler Update Scheme. And many cynics have said, are they throwing this under the bus? Which I, is in heat pump land, that's considered a joke. Um, so the Domestic RHI will be ending in March 2022. Just so you know what that means, if you were having a heat pump installed in your house today, as long as you got it signed off and commissioned and finished by the 31st of March this year, you will be on the old scheme. And if it runs over onto the 1st of April 2022, you will be on the new scheme. There is no flexibility. It's a very hard cutoff date. The big difference is that the new grant, which is coming in in April, is a single one-off payment of £5,000 if you go air source and £6,000 if you go ground source. So the big difference and uh, about this is that at the moment, the grants can be in larger and worse insulated properties, can be quite a lot higher than £5,000. So example, in air source heat pumps, the peak is about 11,000 over seven years. Um, so it's changing a little bit, but that single one-off payment is designed to move towards people who don't have the money to wait seven years for their money. They want the money up front. So that's the idea. It's sort of moving towards an upfront payment. Um, and of course, as always is the case when the grants change, um, we will see a change in the, the people and the number of people who, who jump onto this. So at the moment, um, with the RHI, it tends to lend itself towards people who've got some money and have got a kind of quite high demand for heat. So typically sort of three, four bedrooms and above. Um, what we're going to see uh, with this one-off payment is this will move us towards the sort of one, two, three bedroom and better insulated newer properties um, where the £5,000 makes much more of an impact. Um, so... 
It is suggested that the scheme is going to make uh, our industry boom like the clappers. So currently there's something of the order of 40,000 heat pump installations per year in the UK. In, in, that was in 2021. Um, and everybody's predicting that number is going to boom enormously. And that's something we're going to talk a little bit about over the next few slides. So next slide, please. So one of the major things that you'll hear a lot about, especially from the ground source heat pump or GSHP lobby, is that their grant is changing enormously. So in, in certain circumstances, you could pick up a grant today of 20, 25,000 pounds for a ground source heat pump. And this is going to be capped at 6,000 pounds in April. So the ground source lobby are not as keen on this new um, this new scheme. And they're saying this is going to affect their industry quite a bit. Um, a, because generally speaking, ground source goes into larger installations and larger installations are going to be the ones who are hit uh, most by this change. So they have a little bit of work to do and they've got to have a little think. However, those of us who've been around in the industry for a while believe that those very, very large installations where the, where, where the ground source is, is quite a major cost um, will still go ahead. People who want to go down the green journey will still go ahead. Um, but um, unfortunately, the homeowner will have to pay more of the fee themselves. Um, so air source is much more common. Um, there's something of the order of um, 10 times as many air source units as ground source units put in, um, mostly because they're more suitable to smaller and the more common house sizes. So air source heat pumps, they're predicted that the market's going to grow very, very quickly um, and ground source will become more niche and very, very sort of top end. Um, very large installations, um, you would go for ground source. Next slide, please. So one of the things that, and this is a somewhat unpopular view, but one of the things that we find as we go and speak to the general public is their biggest concern is temperature. And I like to call this temperature anxiety. So right now, I will try and persuade you to take your existing gas boiler and replace it with a lovely air source heat pump. But the biggest challenge is that I'm going to try and persuade you to drop the temperature of your radiators from something like 70 degrees today or, or very hot to the touch um, down to something like 50 degrees centigrade. And our industry has pushed this this message for the last uh, something like 15 years. Uh, but what we're seeing is some resistance from the general public. You say, why can't I have my radiators hot? Well, I'm paying the bill. Why can't I have what I want? So one of the predictions we have over of about this industry over the next couple of years is the sort of rise of the higher temperature heat pump. So higher temperature, slightly lower efficiency. But if the general public want their radiators to be very hot, maybe we as an industry have to start thinking about giving them what they want instead of trying to force them into what we want to sell them. Um, so the advantage of going for the higher temperature, although the, uh, the run cost will be higher, is you don't need to change radiators, pipe work, cylinders, etc. And it makes the installation much, much easier for your, for your gas uh, trained engineer. They just view it as a heat pump is a boiler which will be living in the garden. Um, so very, very similar installation. Next slide, please. Um, so the, this does raise an interesting um, quandary, which is that in new build where you have no nothing installed, um, you can design your house to work beautifully with the lower temp heat pumps using things like uh, heat pump cylinders, using underfloor heating, larger radiators, etc. So what we see is that the new build market will will go straight for the ultra high efficiency, lower run temperatures, whereas the retrofit will go for the lower efficiency, higher temperatures. So there's gonna be a little bit of divergence between the two. Um, and I believe there's some regulation coming in saying that in new build, they are gonna try and limit our run temperatures um, to about 50 degrees C. Um, so you can see that with the, with the uh, building regs and so on. Um, the, the beauty is that by persuading the homeowners to drop the temperature of their radiators, we get a reduction in running costs, which obviously is very um, sort of buzzy at the moment. Everyone's talking about how can we save money with the, with the very rapid increase in energy prices. Um, so, again, one of the things we're seeing is that uh, the major house builders will start um, 
becoming more and more pro air source heat pumps. At the moment, they already are pro heat, uh, heat pumps, um, but it's something that they will uh, become more and more um, keen on. That's the idea. Um, and they will be running with underfloor heating generally in um, new build houses, especially in high end developments. Um, the problem is obviously in the in the budget houses, in social housing and so on, underfloor heating is quite expensive, so they're trying to save their cost. So in those cases, we would expect to see radiators um, uh, at sort of medium temperatures, around about 50, 55 degrees C. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the massive challenges we have if, if when people come to us saying, I have a, a gas boiler, condensing gas boiler at home, um, the problem we have is that in gas boilers, the speed of the water as it moves around the house is very, very slow. So um, the, the water has plenty of time after it leaves the boiler to lose temperature. And, and typically we'd see a drop in temperature um, of about 20 degrees C from the output of the boiler till the time it comes back. But in heat pumps, we have this bizarre thing that we like to only allow the temperature to drop five degrees C. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out that we're gonna try and move the water four times as quickly as you are used to in a condensing boiler. And what that means is you end up with larger pipe work, bigger pumps, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that's being discussed, mostly by me, I think, is why can we not produce heat pumps with a wider delta T to make them more easy to fit into a system which is designed to have a delta T of 20 degrees C. And um, it is something which is being looked into, this idea of we need to make heat pumps easier to fit onto an existing heating system. Um, so this is something that a lot of people in our industry are pushing for is that heat pumps can be quite complicated um, historically, it's always been, that, yeah, if you look at the diagram, you can see on the right of that slide, there's quite a lot of stuff going on. Um, if that was a gas boiler, most of that stuff would not exist. Um, and we as an industry need to move towards simpler, easier installations to make life easier for the poor plumber who's trying to put the things in. So one of the things we're seeing is the manufacturers are beginning to take components that we used to sort of fit on site and start putting them into the box of the machine. A bit like the boiler lads do. It's very, very peculiar, the idea now that you'd buy a boiler and a separate pump. Most boilers have a pump in them um, because the boiler manufacturers worked out that that was what the, the market wanted. And we in heat pump land have been a little bit slow about following that um, model, but we're getting there. So we're moving from the kit car market to the Ford Focus market. Next slide, please. Um, I, I have a bit of a bugbear about controls, um, which is that I have never seen a decent set of heating controls from anyone ever. Um, it seems to be that the, the secret when designing heating controls is to make them mind crushingly complex so nobody can use them. Um, and in heat pump land, ours are even worse than those that are used by the boiler lads. So it's something that we, we hear a lot of consumers saying, can we have simpler, cleverer controls? Um, but also controls that are, that we're beginning to see a little bit of rise of controls which are internet connected, where the control is actually really looking after your house. So um, where it learns how your house adapts to the ambient temperature outside and so on. Um, and so you don't really need to mess around with your controller at all. The system will learn how your house works um, without you having to tamper with it. So kind of moving away from having a time clock, a sort of rigid time clock to something which is really intelligently looking at your system saying it's warm outside today. I don't need to run the heating as much or it's going to be cold tomorrow. So let's get the heating on and predict that. So I think we're going to see these sort of smarter controls becoming more and more popular. Um, so that you don't have to tamper with them yourself. So next slide. Um, so this is something, sorry, I jumped a slide there, but essentially one of the things that is also becoming very, very popular is that your heating is probably your biggest consumer of energy in your house. Um, but if you have photovoltaic on the roof, you have electric car chargers and so on, it makes an enormous amount of sense to try and get your heating and your PV and your car charger and everything else kind of working together along with some kind of agile tariff 
and actually predicting the um, the way your energy could be used to minimize your cost. And we're beginning to see now these um, sort of integrated controls where they're where they're linking everything together. Some of the big manufacturers, um, Solar Edge, Tesla, et cetera, EcoForest, um, et cetera, are all beginning to get these controls to talk to each other. So at the moment, they kind of tend to be separate. So each thing doesn't talk to each other, but it makes a lot of sense. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to work out that you know, I look out the window today, it's lovely and sunny. I'm making a little bit of PV on the roof. Let's try and use that PV instead of sticking it into the grid. So do we charge our car? Do we use our heating? Do we do our hot water functions when it's sunny and so on? So this is quite exciting, this idea that um, you've got a sort of intelligent control system running everything together. Next slide. So I think, well, that was very, very rapid. We have time for questions. Um, so, so um, I never quite know how to pronounce your name, but uh, I think it's Sunny or Sunny. Um, I concur with um, with what you say about controllers. We just fitted a heat miser, and it's um, uh, not very good. Um, any recommendations <laughs> for non-stupid ones, Graham? <laughs> Um, I'm a bit old fashioned. So in my house, I have an incredibly complicated heat pump system. I, I, I like to trial them at home. And I have what I consider to be the ultimate thermostat. Mine is a Honeywell mechanical wall stamp. <laughs> it never goes wrong. It's never adjusted. It just controls the temperature. Um, <laughs> but it's not that it's a bit old fashioned. So I am actually bizarrely, I'm in the process of fitting one of these predicting thermostats in. Um, so my thermostat, I have a prototype. So I seem to have a bit of a reputation for being willing to test anything at my house. So I have a prototype which not only predicts the ambient temperature and my room temperature, it also looks at the solar gain. So, yeah. um, so looking for a, a great example today is my heating is on at home. I have a badly insulated house but my machine will be able to predict that it's sunny and that we don't need much heating because the sun is going to help heat the house. And it is quite impressive how much impact a sunny day does make, even if it's cold, on your heating load. So the next question is from Laura, um, and it's, uh, are any grants available for small developers or are any that are available that, uh, or are already coming? <laughs> okay, so the problem is that all of the grants are designed to, pay. this is the way I think of it, and I think it's a neat solution. You only get a grant if you, the homeowner, chose the heating system. So when you're doing a new build development, you, the developer, are choosing the heating system for the homeowner. So the homeowner wasn't involved in that discussion and doesn't get a grant. So new build doesn't get a grant whereas uh, retrofit does. Whether there will be a grant for new builds, it's been talked about forever. I am going to put my head on the block and say, I don't think it will ever come. Um, that their, their view is that you should, as a developer, be doing green things. Therefore, you shouldn't need incentivizing. But I'm not a politician. I, I think I tend to agree with you on that. Um, yeah, so I... There, I think there will be more um, stick than carrots to make people move towards um, heat pumps on the on the developer side. Um, and you know, the the if you look historically, that's how the government tends to um, implement change. Is they will give uh, carrot at the start um, to encourage the early adopters, and then as the technology becomes more established, then then it becomes less carrot more stick um and then eventually it becomes all stick to get laggards um over the line um and you know you look at that in terms of of how vehicle taxation and all the other things work they they all work in a similar way yep. um a question from um uh megan um i work with historic and listed buildings and we're often told it's not efficient to install heat pumps due to the limitations of the thermal fabric improvements uh, and, and on several projects recently, we've had oil systems specified by engineers um, in favour uh, over um, uh, over uh, renewables. Do you have any thoughts and experiences on this? Lots. Um, it's complete <laughs> rubbish. 
Yeah, well, you can heat anything with a heat pump. So I live in a 1922 appallingly insulated house, um, and I have a heat pump. The, the, if I'm really honest, it's about laziness. So if you have a well-insulated new build house, it's really, really easy to put a heat pump in. If you have a dreadfully insulated house, um, which you can't increase the insulation on, it's harder to do. And one of the things you need to bear in mind is that there's not enough installers. So the installers are picking the work that they find is easiest to do. And you know, very large, very badly insulated properties are hard work, so why bother? And I know that sounds terrible, but it's true. Um, but there are a number of other limitations too. So I, I'll give you a very quick example. My parents live in a 220 meters squared, 1800s house. Um, the heat load of that house is too big for a single heat pump. So you'd need to use two. Um, we'd also need to change all the radiators, install a new hot water cylinder and so on. The problem is because it's an old house, it's listed. So you can't get planning permission to put two heat pumps outside. So I look at that as an installer and say, oh, forget it. Why bother? On to the next job. So we can do the job, but it's harder to do the large, badly insulated jobs. So people, unfortunately, um, don't touch them. Hopefully that will change in the future. Um, but I don't see without changes in planning, I don't see how that will be done. Yeah, I mean, we, we often see um, ground source heat pumps being installed in that type of um, application because you don't have to have the heat pump externally and therefore you don't get around a lot of the planning limitations and, and that kind of thing. But then obviously you've got the additional installation cost of associated with ground source. Um, so, yeah, it can they, it definitely can be done. Um, and it's something that, you know, it's the kind of project that we work on quite regularly as well. So uh, it's a good um so question from uh, Chris, um, I'm exploring having a heat pump uh, installed on my property built in 2018 and I'm struggling to find any grants that would be applicable to myself. Um, am I generally stuck having to fund this myself? No. Uh, no, so you should be able to get, <laughs> well, the RHI, RHI up until the end of March, I think you might struggle to, um, to find an installer that can install um, a heat pump before the end of March and benefit from the RHI, but the uh, boiler replacement scheme, um, the bus, you should be it's jumping on the bus. Well, the, the, the 2018 is an interesting point. 2018 will be well insulated. So um, unless it's enormous, you might be in that peculiar, so there's quite a few peculiar installations where um, the heat load of the house is quite low, so actually the, the boiler replacement scheme or the boiler upgrade scheme pays more than you would get on RHI. So one of the things that um, we run a little calculator that will, will predict your, your grant, um, and we see in these sort of and the very well insulated houses, we're actually saying to people, why not wait because you're going to get five thousand pounds, whereas if you go now, you might get less. So that's the sort of thing you you should be looking at. But yes, of course, there is a grant. You're retrofitting. Yep. Um, so, question from Glyn: um, What's your thoughts about high temperature air source um, to re simply replace a gas boiler? Uh, what would the process be in order to actually get an air source heat pump? Um, so EPC analysis, etc. cetera, uh, with the £5,000 grant, uh, what would be the remaining cost? Um, well, I suspect the remaining cost will come down to the size of the property um, and what the, what the heat load is um, and how much needs to be upgraded. So that's probably a, a bit of a, how long's a piece of string type of question, but certainly something that we could look at as, yeah. as a, in a feasibility study. Um, but, but Graham, talking but more generally about um, high temperature heat pumps, I think it's something we touched on in the presentation. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the replacement from oil or gas to uh, uh, the, essentially there are three types of heat pumps. They're so-called sort of normal heat pumps, which run about 50 degrees. If we put one of them in, we need to modify radiators, etc. Quite a few of the machines on the market now will do 60, which is better, but not amazing. Um, and there are a very, very limited number of ultra high temperatures, so 80 degrees C machines. So we tend to use these when we're replacing oil in bigger properties and so on. Um, bizarrely, they're the easiest units to install because they run at the same temperature. So it's not quite as easy, but chop off the old boiler, 
replace with heat pump, turn it on, leave everything in place, can be done. The thing to bear in mind is the ultra high efficiency, sorry, ultra high run uh, temperature units are lower efficiency. So you get smaller grants, slightly higher run costs and so on. So if you're taking the shortcut of not bringing your heating system up to spec, expect higher run costs. So cheaper to install, more expensive to run. You never get anything for nothing. Um, so the next question is from Lucy. Um, uh, I want to start building a new small two bedroom bungalow by the end of the year and want to use an air source heat pump for heating. Would I be eligible for any of the grants uh, starting in April? Um, I don't know. Um, nobody knows. Uh, so if you, if you did it today, um, you would get RHI because in self-build you get because you're choosing the heating system you get the rhi it's one of the questions we have about the boiler upgrade scheme is we don't know if they're going to continue that probably will so you will be eligible for um the grant but it's something don't bank on it today we need to make sure that we get the the full details of the boiler upgrade scheme before you spend the money yeah that's it the um the, the government have been a little bit slow about publishing all the they've they've sort of announced the policy in sort of broad terms but they haven't um given all the uh, fine detail yet so so there's still a few unknowns and that's that's one of the sort of big unknown areas um but yes we we would certainly hope that there'll be some sort of support for people who want to uh choose a a um a high a high efficiency um heating system um, question from Alex. Is there any point in swapping out a gas boiler for a heat pump for an existing passive house? Currently, we use about 3,000 kilowatt hours a year uh, for heating and hot water. So I'm going to be slightly controversial here. I definitely wouldn't do it today because your RHI will be almost nothing. Um, if you do it in April, you'll get £5,000. So you are very much one of the people that we would move into the new scheme yeah. because it's more beneficial. One of the things you need to bear in mind is that at 3,000 kilowatt hours of heat per year, you're not really using much heat. So we can't, if you don't use much heat, I can't save you any money. Yeah. Um, so is it worth doing, if you look at it purely from a pound, shillings and pence point of view, possibly not. If you're looking at it from a carbon point of view, of course, yes. So the question there really back is how much impact to your carbon would you like to make? Yeah, and, uh, and also, of course, it, it also depends on other things such as how much PV have you already got, you know, so therefore how much, you know, potentially you're then not substituting um, buying energy in because uh, you could be, you know, you're not just substituting buying one type of energy in for buying another type of energy in because potentially you could be getting quite a lot of that energy for free um, from your PV array. Um, you've also got to consider things um, like, you know, what the resale uh, resaleability of that house is if you're looking to resell it you know if it, somebody who is buying a passive house and is looking for a passive house to buy would probably put greater value on a house that has a very high efficiency heating system than one that doesn't so so there might not be a direct running cost saving but it might increase the value of the house more than you might think so there's, there's probably lots of different uh lots of different ways of looking at that same answer mm. Well, that's that's all the questions um, that we've got at the moment. So, if there are any more, um, then then type them in quickly. Um, oh. oh yeah, here we go. Um, so, question from Glyn: um, Would an air source heat pump external unit fall within permitted development? Yes, if you meet three criteria. So, one is it has to be under a certain size. They all are. Um, the or even that most... massive Bosch thing that they showed last year. <laughs> <laughs> The Leviathan. Okay, so there are but nobody's going to buy that. Um, the so yes, but the main one is this, and you can do a very very simple test on this. There's a bizarre calculation we have to do, which is we have to predict the noise of the heat pump at your neighbor's property. So very very roughly, have a quick sort of plan of where you would put your heat pump, 
Um, imagine tying a piece of string round it, seven meters long, and see if that piece of string you could touch a window of your neighbor's house with. If you can't, so your neighbor is more than seven meters away, you will go through on permitted development. If your neighbor is less than seven meters away, we have to do some clever bits and pieces to essentially shut the unit up so your neighbor doesn't hear it or of course persuade you to move it somewhere where seven meters is is far enough but that's kind of a it's a really rule of thumb thing if you're seven meters from your neighbor we can get you through on permitted development if you're closer it is much harder to do then do you agree with the myth of slc pumps creating lots of noise um or is it down to just poor design um well certainly in my experience the actual heat pumps themselves are very very quiet um if you have noise issues almost always it comes down to some sort of reverberation issue um so you have lots of hard surfaces around it and you just get the noise bouncing around um and sounding louder than it actually is because it kind of adds itself up um if you put some soft planting some um around it you know you don't have loads of hard surfaces directly opposite um and you think about which direction the noise is going to come out of the heat pump because most of it comes out through the fan um then generally speaking not a problem would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, the, the, in the bad old days, heat pumps were noisy. They get quieter and quieter every year. Um, they are not silent, but and I, I have this ridiculous suggestion, which I suggest everyone tries. If you want to try a heat pump without spending any money, get an extension lead, run it outside the house, take your microwave oven out the kitchen and plug it in where the heat pump would go because a heat pump and a microwave oven make very very similar noise so that gives you an idea if if you put your mic don't leave it outside for long but if you put your microwave where you think your heat pump would go if that's too noisy it's disrupting your sleep or whatever then we need to move the heat pump around but they are getting quieter and quieter it would be very very difficult to sell them if they were horribly noisy those days are a long long way behind us yeah. Graham, uh, only really remains for me to say thank you uh, once again for your um, for your diligence um, in answering the questions, um, and thank you everybody for for attending today. I'm going to uh, end the recording here, and I uh, and I hope that we'll see you again on another uh, mesh webinar very very soon. Yeah, thanks thank very you. much. Cheers. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye.